Okay, we, we're gonna get started. Thanks a lot for your pension, patience, guys. Um, so this is the first lecture of a spring uh, lecture series. We're continuing, as you you can see on our uh, on the information on our website with the third place uh, theme. And and for that today we have the first speaker uh, guest speaker for the for the spring lecture series is Javier Arpa from 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 Spain. I'm gonna. Um, uh, so it, it's, a little bit, it's a little bit difficult to introduce Javier. I've known him more than 30 years, which is, you know, three, three yeah, yeah, <laughs> like a three zero. So there you go. Yeah, uh, and I've been following during all of these decades, I've been following his career uh, all around the world. Uh, he's, uh, he, has a, he has taught, uh, well, he studied in, Delft, is that right? He studied at the School of Madrid also. Delft in the Netherlands is probably one of the best uh, uh, schools of architecture in Europe. And he has taught, uh, let, me, let me think about the list, at Columbia, Harvard, uh, Belleville, um, Versailles, so in France, in a couple Ivy Leagues. And currently he's uh, the research coordinator of uh, the think tank, uh, the Y Factory at uh, the TU Delft in the Netherlands. Luckily for us, he's also a, a guest lecturer. He, I mean, he's, he's a lecturer this semester at the University of Pennsylvania at, at UPenn in Philadelphia. So we were able to bring him here with us, right? So um, he's gonna, uh, he's the perfect speaker to discuss anything that has to do with the built environment connected to politics, society, and connected to the larger themes on the third place, like gentrification, displacement, etc. And today he's going to give us a broad overview of many of the things he has done on his career. So we are really in for a treat. So help me thank, help me welcome Javier Arpa. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks, Clemson. Thanks, David, for uh, letting me be here uh, today, this afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to give you an overview of the work I have been doing in the last couple of decades uh, that has to do with research, communication, and action. And I hope that we will be covering some of the topics that are in the description of the third, uh, of the third place lecture series. So there's, I think, many topics that, that uh, we are all interested and concerned about. So I hope that this is uh, informative, uh, helpful, etc. I really hope so that you have questions later and that we have a nice uh, discussion. Um, excuse, I'm going to start showing you a lot of images. Don't panic, it's a lot, but uh, I will be fast. Also, I tend to speak very fast. That's a problem that the Spaniards we have. And, um, and also, excuse me for my sometimes, uh, it's a little bit of a shitty accent. But anyway, I think that you are very used already to international speakers, so that should not be a problem. As I mentioned before, um, what we are going to look at is not the disciplinary side of it, but what, it, what is it that I'm going to do with the topics I have been working on for these years, no? And I think that for me now, what is becoming more and more important is how we engage the different publics. How do we research, not only research, how do we communicate, disseminate, and invite others to act? Uh, how do we transfer knowledge from academia, from here, to the outside world, if I might call it like that, no? to other peoples with different sensitivities and different concerns who do not so much, uh, who do not know so much of what we do know here. No? Sometimes my, my impression is that we know a lot, that we share a lot among us, but then when it comes to going outside, then how do we actually engage with others in order to participate in the fabrication of a better world of all the societies or cities, etc. No? So I love to start with this picture. I feel very really identified with this man, with this, well, maybe he's a little bit bigger than I am, but that's not what I mean. I really like that moment of doubt, that moment of sincere, uh, let's say, reflection, uh, and because I always, I took this picture in, um, in a building in London, in Tower Hamlet, in the east of London, uh, in one of the buildings by David Adjie. 
Um, as I said, I love this moment of doubt and reflection because doubt is what has driven me to research in this, in this couple of decades. I'm going to have a look at what is it that I did when I finished my studies. I, was, I graduated in Delft, in the University of Delft in the Netherlands, and then I, was, I soon knew that I wanted to work in a uh, publication. I wanted to disseminate architectural production. Um, one of my dreams when I was very young was to be or to own El Croquis. I don't know if you know that. Of course, I never fulfilled that dream, but uh, still, I had the chance to start working as editor-in-chief, or I ended up being editor-in-chief at A+T, which is an architecture publisher based in Spain, by publish, who publishes internationally. You know? So what is it that we did at A+T? At A+T, again, let's go back and meet our uh, friend here. This is the picture that I was showing you. It inspires me, inspires doubt, etc., etc. But let's get away from the beautiful picture that we published, the black and white and the retouch, etc., etc. And let's go to the reality of the place where we were. This is this building by David Adji, which is not the third space, but maybe the second space. This is one of the civic hubs in one of these uh, impoverished uh, uh, neighborhoods of London, Tower Hamlets, as I said. It's a public building, it's a library, but it's beyond that. It's beyond a library. A lot of use has happened there. And uh, these pictures, I was, taking, I was taking those pictures because this was very much a methodology that we used at A T. We had the chance back then to have the means to go visit places, visit buildings we were interested in. We were interested in this library because it didn't look like a library. It was a library, but they ha it had this sort of commercial side to it. I think we, I mean, what happened back then is that uh, the we need to acknowledge the retalization, if that's a word, but I hope that you understand what I mean, of uh, civic centers and libraries like this. Uh, for many years, these kind of places have been sacralized. No, library, let's go to the library. And you remember, the, oh, I don't know, the neoclassic columns, et cetera, et cetera. There's a certain weight to all these buildings. So we're actually looking for these architectures that desacralize the same uses so that the publics were actually much more engaged and much more interested in going to places like this. Then what I really love about this architecture is that David Adji was inspired by the city that was surrounding him. No? So he was inspired by the market that was existing there. You see all these tents with the green and white. And then he used those uh, same colors and same patterns in the facade of his building, no? inspired by the public space that it's outside. Then the building becomes extremely welcoming. No? So the access is no longer this kind of doors, et cetera, et cetera, that are complicated or seem difficult to open, but it's really connected to the public space. This is the kind of buildings that I was interested in publishing in, the, in, the, in, in, in those series. And this is how we published it. We, don't, we didn't simply get those images and put them there with the text which is done by the architect. We never tend, we didn't like very much to do, that, to do so. So what we did in our work is, first of all, choose why that, uh, say why we had chosen that building there. Where were those reasons? Some of the reasons that I am mentioning now. No? Then we put the building into the urban context because these civic buildings have a lot to do with the urban context, context where they are inserted. There's no building without the city, city without the building, uh, at least for us. No? And then we kept, uh, kept going in this systematic analysis of all this architectural production to look at what were the areas and then what was the program. We always redrew. This is something that I have been doing for the very beginning of my career, is to redraw, trying to redraw the, um, the, this architectural production with the same language so that you can actually compare. Redrawing, compare is something that you will pre are already probably doing, no? but we did systematically such a, such a thing in our magazines. And then there's another uh, surveys about the, the sustainability. We still called it sustainability back then. This is the early 2000s, etc., etc., and some other information about how the building was perceived by the citizens once it was built and used. No, Don't, so what I did was, was to go from from our friend then the building, then outside, and then it becomes a whole series. No, This is what the series called Civilities, which included all these uh, points of encounter or hubs or architectures that desacralize these civic uses. No, this is, They were no longer uh, this kind of heavy loaded uh, kind of places. So this is, this is how we compare them. You see the same. We always use systematic analysis of the, of the, of the architectural production. But at A plus T, what actually interests us the most was the occupation of the territory, was housing. Housing, you know, that it actually represents 70% of the city fabric. And uh, we were trying to see what was the 
where was housing located in the territory? And we started with this very basic gra uh, um, diagram, no? So, okay, let's look at housing production. From what point of view? Not just any housing. So we, uh, let's say we were defenders from models of life that don't have anything to do with this one. We started looking at suburbanization. We started looking about this idea. I don't know if it's, I, I wouldn't call it uh, utopia. I would call it, this is a subtopia, no? This idea, I want to have my own garden where I ha it belongs only to me, and I don't want to do, have anything to do with my neighbors. And if somebody puts a open garden, I'm going to actually build a fence. No, this is what this image represents to me, and this is exactly what we never wanted to publish. I have never published in 20 years a single, single family house. So those who live in single family house in the suburbs of, <laughs> of the United States, don't expect me to publish them. I will never do that. Why? Because in order to build this fa the city fabric, we need a lot of territory. This is the very simple uh, explanation of why we are interested in density. You know very well, I suppose you have already been explained why. Uh, the main reason being that we don't have seven planets, we only have one. If everybody lives like this, we would need about seven planets, but you know that's impossible as far as I'm concerned. So we need to live otherwise. Now, this is why we became extreme defenders of uh, urban density. I guess that you know why, so I will not go into the details of, of that, no? but it goes from CO2 emissions to community life. And these, once we knew, once we have an agenda, this is what we want to publish, then we go into the search for those projects who fulfill our agenda and start publishing them. No? So we did this kind of systematic analysis and redrawing of the, of the housing production throughout, of housing, collective housing production throughout I don't know, at least 12 years, from different point of view, you know, be it the cost, the situation on the, on the, inside the city, uh, FAR, all sorts of parameters. You know? One of the things that I uh, was interested in when I came, I had studied in the late 90s in the Netherlands, there was this uh, period in which data escapes were very popular. No? So one of the things that I was interested in, in bringing when I, was, uh, I, started, when I started working at A plus T is all these uh, landscapes of data. No? How could we, in a very simple manner, because it was very something of an intuition, how to compare and represent and try to understand all the data, this data, in, st in this case, about collective housing, which fulfilled our agenda. So we took, let's say, like, uh, traditional urban forms, then other projects, redraw them in order to, uh, in order to understand what these uh, kind of coefficients and, param and parameters were. No? So what is important for us, or what was important, or what is for me important to say, is how we would take all this architectural production to be published in a different manner. We were not that interested in showing, for instance, what Art Daily does. Art Daily is great. So I have no, nothing against that kind of media. But at the same time, is there any criticality? Is there any analysis, any layer extra that you can bring to that production? This is what we try to do in the different publications that were part of this, of this series, uh, etc. cetera. No? And then when you talk about the city, the city is not only collective housing. We would only, high density doesn't make the city. You can be in neighborhoods in China with a huge density and still not feel like cities. So, what other artifacts, what other buildings, architectures make up the city. And then we were really interested in observing, analyzing, and comparing uh, hybrid, what we call hybrid buildings. Hybrid buildings for us are buildings which I wouldn't, for me, English sometimes I get a little bit lost, but this is not a mixed use. This is not several uses stuck together. What we were interested in this, in, uh, in this case was those architectures that include a lot of public realm the public realm of the city, of the outside space, conventional outside space, public outside spaces, going inside the buildings. Sometimes I remember a friend of mine saying, well, in the end, a hybrid building is like a person you really want to meet, no? So that's a, maybe a nice, interesting way of understanding all this production that you see analyzed and redrawn in order to be compared here, no? What is the city without public spaces? What is the city without the spaces between the building? And this is where public space design, landscape architecture design comes into play. No? So we couldn't just talk about the city through the lens of housing, but we had to look at and compare in the same systematic manner a large amount of, uh, of public spaces or uh, projects. No? This is, we started from, um, this is a very intuitive way, a very simple way to study it. You see these layers, no? open, closed, water. 
It's intuition. And then as an editor, you say, well, maybe you need to add more. And then this is when, uh, instead of only uh, looking at the layers that made those public spaces, we started looking at the strategies behind the mind of the designer so that we could show those strategies that you as designers could transfer to your own projects. No? It's sort of a copy-paste catalog with a, with a certain decency, if I, may, if I may say. So we take the public spaces, the public spaces, how these public spaces are made, no? how do, how, what are they composed. So in the end, the picture on the right it starts to be less interesting, I hope, than the information that we started taking out from, uh, from, uh, from those projects. You know? What is the aim, what is the input, and what is the strategy? Besides the nice picture that you see in there, et cetera, et cetera. You know? And then if you collect all these strategies, all these aims, and all these inputs uh, of public spaces and landscape architecture, you could have a whole catalog and guide of strategies that designers could apply. This was a publication which is, which is or which was uh, aimed at designers. This is, this is at first my initial public. No, the first public I engaged with was uh, designers like, like like us. But then, uh, in the next chapter of my of my of my career, uh, I just started thinking that we don't only talk to designers, or only talking to designers is not to, is not going to bring us too far, and. Uh, I left uh, A plus T. I left A plus T because the country where I was living back then, Spain, suffered a huge, big burst of a housing bubble. Probably you already heard of 2008. Many of you uh, had the chance not to be, you were probably children then. But those who had to suffer, suffer it, we ended up leaving, many of us, many professionals, ended up leaving our country. This is histories of migration, not the first time. We migrated. We left. In my case, I left Spain because uh, I, was, uh, made, uh, I was laid off from the company where I was working. But when I left, I had no problem to go. I was privileged enough to be able to move to France, where I had already be, uh, lived. Others were not as lucky as I was. And uh, this is something that maybe it's important to, to keep considering. Uh, the city that never was is the research that I started undertaking, trying to understand why I left. So um, this is, uh, for me, was a comeback to the ruins that uh, my country, uh, <laughs> to the ruins that, let's say, that littered the country where in the, in that I left. No? And this, for me, this was, this is an image from the 18th century. It looks, uh, it's, uh, sorry for being so Eurocentric, no? but this is, this is the uh, romantic trips that, uh, that British or French, or German aristocrats would do to southern uh, Italy or Greece in order to understand the ruins of the past. What I really like about this image, which was, my uh, feeling or my sensation, or my sensations when I saw the, what you're going to see now, is the scale, no? the human beings next to this ruin that has just been discovered, those that are analyzing that production, and in the end, how nature, you see it on top of the, uh, of the, uh, of the ruins, how nature starts taking over. No? So these are phenomena that I just started finding in places like this. This is Madrid. So this is the place where I was born. And uh, what happens here, this is a ruin, in a way, just like the one that, that we just saw. No, this is abandoned, incomplete development. So for many years, Spain was, uh, uh, let's say, uh, an, enter a sort of a race uh, that had to do with uh, lots of investments coming from the European Union, et cetera, et cetera. We should give an entire conference or lecture about it, but I will try to be a little bit more uh, faster than that. So for many years, the country developed enormously at a very, very high uh, speed. And all these kind of developments were, uh, were being built. Planning in Spain uh, forces the, uh, the uh, stakeholders to first build all the infrastructure, meaning roads, optical fiber, sewage, you name it, before you can start building inside those plots. What happens when the uh, burst arrives is that all that infrastructure is built, but there's nothing, there's no occupants. So in the end, you end up uh, confronting all these kind of landscapes of abandonment at different stages. Some of these places were already inhabited, but as you see, there were many other areas that were not inhabited. Or you end up, uh, 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 end up trying to cross, look at this, uh, this person over there, trying to cross an avenue which is as wide as the Champs Elysees in Paris, which was not complete. Those housing is that housing is almost. You see that 
all the windows are closed, so it's hardly occupied. And it has enormous consequences. Of course, what you are seeing is that the landscape was simply uh, uh, destroyed. And the functions that were supposed to be happening there never happened, nothing happened. So lots of infrastructure, again, infrastructure, 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 and abandoned landscapes because there was no funding or no need, actually, to keep occupying these spaces. It's fascinating sometimes. No? This is the work of a colleague of mine, colleague and friend, Ricardo Espinosa. No? And we went to these places, and you see that the lights were on because the entire plan had only one switch. You turn on the entire plan, even though there are 10 people or 10 homes are actually occupied. No? But you see that there, and you see all the hydraulic systems for recycling, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there's nobody there. No? So just to give you an idea of the stupidity of the planners who didn't think of several switches, at least. No? Anyway, it ends up becoming this fascinating landscape with the lights on, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I know it's very fascinating, very um, Appealing, but at the same is extreme, at the same time, it's extremely dramatic. No, I really love these images. These images, these fascinating ruins. No, how actually nature. You see the trees that they were not yet uh, uh, cut off. They were going to be cut off. No, or these kind of places where you can maybe film some zombie movie or things like that. Infrastructure, uh, a vacancy, and when it comes, I was talking to you about uh, urban plans. Also infrastructure, this is, this is a highway that was never uh, open. So what you have now is an amazing space, uh, not far away from Madrid, where you can do your skateboarding, uh, et cetera, et cetera, no? to go with your bicycle. Architectures, no? also the, the, the different authorities, different governments, be it federal government or regional or municipal governments, trying to have the best architectures no? and always have the best airport, the latest building for this, the, the latest institution headquarters, etc., etc. So the country ended up littered with these stupid architectures. Okay, and I don't mind to call these stupid architectures not made by the stupid architects. Don't make it, don't take it wrong, but this is stupid. This was never occupied. It cost a fortune of taxpayers' euros, and they were never open. So to give you one example, our friend Peter Eisman convinced the president of a region, which is like the, uh, I, I think would be the governor of the state here, he convinced that guy to build that building there with two opera houses in a city with 60,000 people. Only Lincoln are there. In New York City has two opera houses functioning at the same time. Compare New York to Santiago de Compostela. I'm sorry, we want to be big, but yeah. No, it doesn't happen like that. They're all unoccupied, all empty. I said, stupid architecture, not the stupid architects. But maybe that's something for discussion, actually. <laughs> It is something for discussion. Uh, also, because I mean, the stories behind this architecture are fascinating. So, the how Saha Hadid would leave the room if that building wouldn't stand on one pillar only, and that building, that bridge over there, cost several hundred millions of euros because the river is pure mud. Anyway, so, but how these architects, not to talk about Santiago Calatrava, which I think the king of all this, I think he would have a kingdom of ele white elephants. So um, how he was able to be connected to all municipal, um, state and federal uh, governments, including the king and queen of Spain. So I think this, there's, a, there's a lot to be talked about, about the implication of different stakeholders in the uh, end result of these architectures. But let's keep moving. I, I want to show some cool stuff as well. Sorry, not so sad uh, things. But this has enormous implications on the financial uh, structure of an entire uh, nation, which back then was this, almost the seventh power in the planet. Spain was asking, at, was knocking at the door of the G7, so you know. And then this whole uh, economy goes into almost bankruptcy. So the, this is an, a diagram that ex explains the transformation of the entire banking system of Spain, aided and bailed out by the European Union. The country was too big to be bailed out, like Ireland was, like Greece was, but uh, the banking system needed to be built, bailed out with a $40 billion uh, dollar, uh, loan in, uh, put into the banking system. It has all these architectures and all this planning, bad planning, 
have a lot to do with the social landscapes of an entire country. What do you think people were doing? They were being kicked out from their jobs. They lost their job. We lost our jobs, no? Imagine being an architect there. So there was nothing else to be built. Everything was completely stopped, no, and halted. So I was very interested not only in knowing what had happened, but also what do we do about this knowledge I have? How do I show it? So um, in Spain, I was not really welcome to talk about it. So I finally, uh, I, could, I started collaborating with the University of Pennsylvania. And there, uh, with the University of Pennsylvania, we organized this conference in the, at the Architectural League of, uh, of New York. And we started debating about different futures of different ways of doing or building the city uh, different to that. My colleague Christopher Marcinkowski ended up uh, publishing the, this book, The City That Never Was, that tells all these stories. But we wanted to come back to Spain and actually engage with the publics, those suffering this, uh, this crisis, and we got in, in contact with the city of Madrid. The city of Madrid being a, right now is a thriving city. <laughs> it's really an incredible place. I recommend you all to go. And this is the city hall. So we went to city hall and there's a cultural center saying, yes, yes, yes. We're gonna have, you're gonna have the budget. You're gonna do your exhibition and we're gonna show the public. Okay, I wanted the public to know. Uh, we're going to show the public by means of an of a, by means of a exhibition what had happened. So we did all the drawings. We got the we got this budget approved, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, until one day, somebody from upstairs came to the room and said to the director of the center, "Hey, Mister, if you're gonna do," he talked to he looked at me and he said something like, "I don't care about what you do. I don't care about your research. Everything is fine. I don't have anything to tell you, but you." Mr. Director of this center, what are you going to do in life after you do this exhibition because you will be fired? So uh, what uh, happens is that, of course, the exhibition is canceled. The political implications of this project were too big or too, like, like nobody, want, they, actually, I go to Spain, I give this lecture in Madrid uh, to students of architecture like you, and they don't know what happened. There's a certain, I think, and I understand, there's a logical uh, tendency to try to forget try to move forward and not look at these places because what happened at the end of the day is something painful. So anyway, the exhibition project was canceled, uh, the, but the book was published, so at least we have that. And I kept my interest in the speculation together with my colleague Christopher Marcinkowski at the University of Pennsylvania, with, with uh, whom I've been collaborating for many years. And uh, we kept uh, uh, our interest in, our, in the speculation, no? Histories of speculation, what you just saw in Spain is pure speculation, not design speculation, because we will talk about design speculation later, but real estate speculation, no? How speculation has moved to land, from land to agriculture to infrastructure to building to urbanization. Urbanization has become a pure commodity. You know, it's like trading with gold. It's not, I think that there are many stakeholders who don't see, who don't, who don't see architecture as uh, uh, something for the public, something for, with any social meaning, no? I think we are in front of, as I said, a, a pure commodity. And this is what is happening in Africa right now. Uh, we went to Africa, we visited uh, a lot of areas in the continent, and we identified about, I think it's over 100 new cities being built simultaneously that all tend to follow the same pattern. And I'm going to show you, show you now a catalog of beautiful urbanism. Okay, I really have no words to describe this. What is very, really interesting is all these cities being planned, being projected at the same time. So developers are producing these images, these renderings in order to sell a certain kind of dream. There's a very interesting, I would say, dichotomy between reality and what is expected to happen. Something really interesting to, to look at. Everything is lush, everything is green, even if you are in, in the Sahara Desert, okay? So green, no problem. Then you put a circle with a lot of water in the middle of, you know, like Arizona. Exactly the same. Everything is green. So, and then, I mean, it doesn't, we don't need to talk about the urban design because the qualities are not really that interesting. But what is really interesting is this continuous repetition of the same model, no? If Singapore or Dubai were successful ones, let's just do the same all over the African continent and we are gonna be rich and happy and I hope or I wish that it, ha it is the case, but it really isn't. So most of them, oh, by the way, there's always this, this tower, which is the one in New York, Always in all renderings. That's also also a what I'm besides the joke. It's always the same recipe. 
a certain recipe like Singapore or Dubai that is supposed to be successful elsewhere. So these modes of urbanism are repeated again and again, but if you want to see what is, what is common, these are the aspects that we clearly could see uh, uh, behind all these, uh, all these projects that you just saw. No? Once you understand this urbanism, the damage that that urbanism and that these works were producing onto the African territories and landscapes and biomes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, then you want to know who's behind, no? And then we started understanding what the stakeholders are investing uh, in the uh, in these cities all over Africa. This is a timeline of outside Africa act extraction activities uh, in the last 25 years, uh, done mm, mainly by uh, European uh, powers. And what you see on top is in magenta is the number, is the number of visits from or by a Chinese premier to the African continent. And what you see on the right high side is that magenta is getting more and more and more and more and more there. No? I don't need to tell you what this means. There are new colonial powers exercising their power on the African continent in the same way that the European powers used to do it in the, in the, previous, in the previous centuries. No? So, of course, China is not the only responsible. There are many others, no? but it's quite a striking how much China, how much effort China is putting, is putting there. And then you go to these places and start finding the same kind of landscapes that I found in Madrid. This is the supposedly, this was going to be the capital of Equatorial Guinea. Equatorial Guinea, a former Spanish colony in the middle of the rainforest, 200 kilometers inside the rainforest of the coast. And the Teodoro Bian, which is the tyrant who runs this country, who rules this country, was afraid that there would be a coup, so he decided to build his new uh, capital out of oil money. The problem is that oil prices at some point went down, and half of the money invested also went down in the cracks of corruption. So the, 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 the city was never built, and then you would find the same. This, these were 11,000 homes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, no? Cairo, this is Cairo. Cairo has been, uh, let's say, trying to escape from itself, from the center of Cairo. Uh, there's a long tradition of building new Cairos, not only, not only the, the, the new Cairo which is being built now, etc., etc., etc. We could go on no? about examples like this. This is the outskirts of Cairo in the middle of the Sahara Desert. No? What is more important for me is to reflect on this. The image on the left is what is projected, what is expected to happen, and it's completely, uh, let's say, delusional when you compare it with the reality of the places. This is the plan for Kigali 2030. So Kigali in 2030, which is in six years, it's supposed to look like that. So please, Tell me, or you know, I invite you to start designing and start thinking, not designing only, but thinking how we can move from one image to the other. It's, of course, uh, very difficult. So again, we wanted to uh, explain this, to engage with different publics, to try to do things differently from the point of view of, of design. I, I am just a designer, but I could communicate these, uh, these findings. So we finally made it to the first exhibition we made. This is a shopping mall in Kuala Lumpur. It's a very modest exhibition, but at least we could put some panels there and start showing to the Kuala Lumpur publics uh, what was happening in, uh, in Africa. Then we sold or we told the project to other uh, to Germans and they took us a little bit more seriously. So we did this exhibition in Munich trying to explain to different stakeholders what had happened or what was going on in Africa. This uh, image here I really love because what we did was to redraw Again, a methodology that I used for many years at APLST, redraw all these urban plans so that we could compare it, compare them. And also what we did was to put them on top of the different biomes of Africa. It doesn't matter where you put them because those plants never reflected the realities of the, play, of the landscapes where they were, they were being, they were being uh, placed. Anyway, those are images of the, of the, uh, of the exhibition. I'm going to move to something a little bit happier because I don't want to be talking about disaster and failure, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's interesting, but I, I also would like to do how, to show you how I continued my interest for collective housing and the fabrication of the city. When I was appointed curator of the uh, exhibition a Paris Habitat in, in Paris, where I used to live for many years, a Paris Habitat is a housing agency, one of the largest housing agencies in Europe. Um, if you don't know, um, well, the, the 
French Republic has in its constitution, has entered in this constitution a new rule. It says that all housing that um, is built must contain, or new development must contain 30% of affordable housing. So now you have a constitution who tells you exactly what you need to do. So one of these agencies that produce, has been producing this housing for 100 years is Paris Habitat. One single figure which I find interesting here is that 10% of the population of Paris, which is a very expensive city, at least for European, for, for in European terms, uh, can afford living in a, in, a, in a city like this, no? in the compact city. So we looked at these places, we looked how, how people do occupy these homes, how do you live inside, again, working with a photographer, which is a, a work that I do systematically to try to understand this housing from the point of view of the user, always. Until then, try, we try to draw a, a, a understand or to show that Paris could not be understood without the presence of this housing. How these fragments of the city uh, can only be understood by the uh, presence of that uh, social housing that has been built throughout the years. I am not a historian, so what I did, as you see, is use my methodology, which is redraw. By that, I am flattening history. I am bringing every, all the production into a, a certain moment. Back then was, I think, for 2000, 2014. No? And then I take it from there. All right? So these are, this is, this is uh, fragments of the city made by this uh, production. We redrew also the, 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 the precise architectures. But we did not only understand the presence of these buildings in the city, we also had an agenda, no? an agenda that I already explained. We had this agenda that I brought for M plus T about the dense city, the diverse city, the fertile city, or the intense city, and the agile city. No? So then we were looking at all this production from those points of view or those, or those lenses, no? and then redraw then bring everything to the same moment in history in order to try to compare all this, uh, all this production. As I mentioned, I think that it wouldn't be too ambitious to try to pretend to be a historian. So I tried to, be, to do as honestly as I could from the point of view of a, of a designer. No? This becomes a book. This becomes a book that is distributed and disseminated amongst different publics. But I think what is also very interesting is how do you make then this become an exhibition no? at, the, at, at the Pavilion de l'Arsenal? This is, as you see, a pattern that I try to follow no? throughout my career. You do the research, and then how do you disseminate it in different formats? And this is the Pavilion de l'Arsenal. This is the exhibition uh, images, etc. I've been working a lot with foam, but I don't think we should work with foam anymore. <laughs> but that's, that's things you learn when you hear about climate change, etc., etc. No? But what was interesting, very interesting about that uh, opening day is that we had we were all the architects and the city authorities etc cetera, etc cetera, celebrating the exhibition but at the same time there were several hundreds of people demonstrating outside saying yeah fine you can have your exhibition you can celebrate these hundred years but we still need more housing no? and that moment you realize that you are also making other publics engage no, or people were there demonstrate. That's a great way to participate. Demonstrate we want more housing. Fine with your exhibition. No? So this is this is how do you start uh, translating certain ideas uh, to others outside the uh, outside the, ac the academy, which is what I keep doing within academy, from the academy to uh, outside the academy as curator of public programs. I am a professor at Delft now, and one of my roles is to uh, disseminate the design production within our faculty to the outside world. Maybe this is too ambitious, but at least this is, this is the intention throughout uh, BK Talks, which is a sort of a TV show, um, which is done several times, uh, it takes place several times uh, a month, where we discuss all sorts of topics that not only have to do with design discipline, discipline per se, we do uh, many exhibitions. This is something that I have been, where I have been putting a lot of effort uh, in the last year, no, in the last years, trying to bring all this knowledge and people from outside into the uh, into the uh, into the faculty and talk to the students about things that you don't generally talk uh, as part of your curriculum. No, so this is what what the the the, the program is about. We made it to the Venice Biennale in uh, in 2023 less than a year less than a year ago and uh, we could bring these ideas uh, there no or we could also uh, we also had the chance to bring uh, other others like artists like uh, Ai Weiwei I hear that this is also a college of art I think that's a great combination by the way so into uh, into our faculty now I'm going to 
move to the next chapter of my, uh, of my career, which is the Y Factory. The Y Factory is a think tank, or I don't know if it's a better word for that, um, which is led by Vinny Maas. Vinny Maas is one of the co-founders of uh, the studio MVRDV in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. And this is, the, uh, this is my office. This is the place where I work. So you saw images already because now what I have my office on the second floor next to the blue couches. So from there, uh, our students used to work there. Now we move them to another place. And this is where we also have our exhibitions. This is my daily, this is my daily activity in a building whose tribune is made by uh, MBRDV. No? What do we do at, at the Y Factory? We do design speculation. We look at cities of the future. We um, visualize and parameterize what cities of the future could be with a certain agenda. And at the same time, we disseminate. We produce books, exhibitions, and all sorts of, of events in order to engage with the general public, if that's uh, the, the right term. No? So everything we do with our students ends up or becoming a book, for sure, part of our Future City series, and exhibitions and other kinds of events. I, since I started at the, at the Y Factory, this is what I try to push. No? This is the agenda I try to push uh, when we were working with our students. Our students responded really nicely. Yes, we are happy to build this as an exhibition. No? And then try to bring it outside. To the extent that, I don't know if you saw images, this is, we got the present of uh, one million Lego pieces. And then, OK, let's try to look at the tower. Let's like to criticize the boring glass towers that are all over the, the world and try to make them, we call them por porosity as a project. And how can we work with porosity? How can you open up architecture to, to air, to vegetation, to spaces of encounter? And this is the result of what I, our students did analogically first and then digitally in a second, at the second stage. Uh, the Centre Pompidou in Paris invited us to, to bring the towers to the center. And they finally bought all the towers for the permanent collection. And we are proud. No, that's, sorry to say, but yes, we are very proud. Um, we show, we do, this is a studio work done with our students that ends up uh, being uh, put in a cafe so that people are actually in front of images of possible futures uh, for, the, for, the, for the city. Or we do installation in, installations in the, this is the very center of the city of Eindhoven in the, in the south of the Netherlands. This is an installation, a prototype of collective housing. No? So there's of course extra information that goes with this project, but again, that would be another kind of different lecture. For me, it was very important that we are there in the street and show what our students have thought of collective housing. Um, we brought the same prototype to the uh, Shenzhen Biennial in, uh, in China, or we also, let's say, disseminate our work. No, this is our exhibition in, uh, this is one of the first exhibitions that I did in, in, in the city of Madrid. Then again, this is also in Germany. And I, I, I think that it's also good to, good to look at the subtitle, no? that has to do with everything that we are looking at today. Research, education, and public engagement. No? That's what the uh, Y Factory has been about for many, many years. So these are images of other events. So we do a studio work like you do, and try to communicate it outside, no? and that's uh, in different formats, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is one of the first times that a video of uh, Emmanuel Macron, president of the French Republic, makes it to a Chinese gallery, by the way. So we were also quite happy about that. Again, uh, we bring it to uh, many different places. Sometimes when we are asked to do an exhibition, a special installation, this is the case of Tokyo. What we do is, oh, I mean, we are not going to bring the towers on a, on a container. What we are going to do is to produce the towers with the students from Tokyo so that they also live with the learning of why we are trying to experiment with these Lego pieces, no? that for, for many were so fascinating. So all that ends up being shown in, in that room, in that museum in Tokyo, was actually produced downstairs in the basement by a group of students from Chiba uh, University in Tokyo. No? Engaging with the publics, not only elites going to this museum. No? Uh, then we build, we build a model done by our students and engage and talk with uh, these are citizens from the city of Eindhoven trying to understand why we were making those models. No? And then just start discussions about density, about high rises or not, etc., etc. And uh, this is Vinnie Mas in the picture. He is a person who is very fond of these kind of events, of, let's say, 
talking to others and letting them know why his ideas could be a, a way to improve the city where people live. No? At some point, we were appointed also um, the, uh, uh, we were in charge of Manifesta 13, the Urban Studies Manifesta is a uh, art biennial that uh, takes place in every edition in a different place of the European Union. Uh, in this case, in 2000, uh, I think it was 2018, or no, 2020, it took place in, in Marseille, in the south of France. So before the art curators arrive, you know these biennials, no? And in which all of a sudden the cities are full of stuff and you don't know where it comes from. And it's the case in Venice, by the way, which is the most important or most well-known biennials. I have been working with biennials many times and then you say, yeah, but yeah, but what does this piece come from? What, what is it doing in the middle of the square, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera, no? So Manifesta uh, has been appointed different urban designers or urbanists uh, for every edition so that the art curators understand the cities uh, where Manifesta is going to take place a little bit better. No? So this is why we did these studies about the city of Marseille. We went, we talked to people, we uh, went to places, all sorts of stake, we interviewed all sorts of stakeholders, etc., etc., and then we brought 40 students from Delft uh, who met 40 other students from, from Marseille, eight in total, and we did this. Actually, it was a mess. It doesn't look like it here, but it was really a mess. So this is a model the size of a tennis court with the city of Marseille, on top of which students were proposing ideas for the city from what we had been looking at. No? And each of these ideas could be small, big, far-fetched, less far-fetched, etc., etc. And then we finally produced uh, this, uh, this kind of publication. What was really more interesting when we published there is, was not only, no, it's not really the publication, is to have the publics come in there and uh, trying to understand these ideas and actually react. No? And one of the things that came out from, uh, from what we did in Marseille, from that big model, is the fact that citizens from Marseille started engaging in workshops trying to not replicate, but move forward from the ideas that we were proposing for that for that uh, for that workshop. No, the same happens in the last um, in the last times in uh, in the Czech Republic, where I have been working in the last one and a half years. We uh, organized the organized the studio in order to maybe this is very ambitious. We have been working about talking about cities in this time. We did a studio trying to look at the future of the entire Czech Republic, which is extremely ambitious, I know, but we just at least gave it a try. Um, and we asked our students to get together. There was a 90 people studio in the main uh, faculty of architecture in Prague. And then they uh, started drawing their ideas for the city in a very simple manner, which is with a pencil, their hands on a paper. No? And then we occupied this space, a space of, uh, of the city, which is extremely, of the city, no, of, of the Archi School of Architecture, which is extremely sacred. No? You see all this concrete, etc. It was actually forbidden to, you, to touch the paper. And for at least once or a couple of days, all this paper could be put around. No? And then, this is very, there's a very strange uh, feeling when you are actually using this, uh, this, uh, this building. Anyway, we, uh, we did this first map with ideas for the city, uh, sorry, no, for the, entire, for the entire country by our students. And we started, or well, we did this, this performance, no? This is a kind, this performing move, moves is something that we like to do at the White Factory very often, no? How do you engage with the public by lifting this giant map in the middle of the night, etc., etc., with music and so on. And it engages a, a quite a large audience no? to, uh, to see this, uh, this map with ideas, sometimes very naive, displayed uh, on the walls of an architecture school. Who doesn't allow this to happen? No? So uh, anyway, I always try to thank the students that work with, that work with us. Um, this was the initial part of the studio, but then we went bigger. We took the second atrium of the School of Architecture and then built yet another large map of the Czech Republic with ideas, again, in a styrofoam. That this is a similar methodology to what you saw earlier. We took over that space, and there, this is where public engagement started really happening, no? where students could talk to different 
any kind of visitors, whoever was coming there, talk about the uh, ideas for the for the for the future of the Re of the Czech Republic. We ended up having uh, politicians also come uh, look at uh, look at them and at least engage in 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 these discussions. No, so it became again uh, another public event in which a great array of uh, publics were uh, coming. Again, these are, these are the students that made this possible. Without them, nothing would have happened. I was actually quite afraid sometimes that this scaffolding would fall off on them, etc. but they are all fine, safe and sound, and they came back to their <laughs> places, so nothing happens. And we didn't have insurance, which was also an issue. But anyway, it happened. No? Uh, I think that you already see no, throughout, the, my, throughout my, my, my talk today, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm addressing the need to act. No? The need to add, not only about these local uh, specific places or context, no, but in a broader in, in a broader sense, I think that there's a need to add at a global scale, no, that all of us are facing. This is something that probably you have already seen many times. No, we are all in front of this, in front of these urgencies. I don't need to describe them, but uh, I don't want to call it apocalypse because. I hope it doesn't come, but we need to, let's say, face a dramatic uh, change or a series of dramatic changes. I'm really scared when I see all those trends in dotted lines, etc. No, so what is it that we as designers can do in order to maybe curb a little bit those uh, those trends? No, so. Uh, we have been working on urgencies uh, and try to, uh, before uh, designing, try to address these urgencies. But before even addressing these urgencies, you need to understand how the, what this urgency, what were I, what were I, what is it that we are in front of? No. So there are many ways to categorize. We we like lists. We do lots of lists and try, try to categorize them to try to understand this world in which we are in front of. And then probably we ended up doing a small design. All right, but. Always, since, uh, since a few years, we start trying to make you students aware or the context in which we uh, live, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, we try to understand this by making this list. But of course, lists don't work too well. And we are, at the end of the day, we are designers. So one of the artifacts that we invented was this uh, never, never ending section. It's a section of the biosphere. It's a section of the crust, including soil and atmosphere that shows uh, uh, the geological layers of the soil, the atmosphere, and not only that, in the end, we show the, the natural cycles, how these natural cycles are actually being uh, disrupted by human presence on the, on the planet, no? and what are the urgencies, and what is it that is happening. No? And then it becomes this extremely long section in which we explain, or the students, because this is all a student work, in which a student work try to see how all these urgencies and situations that are lists are placed on the built environment, no? which is at the end of the day what we deal with. So that's uh, this container of information that our students created that we keep using uh, in, 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 many, in, many, in many times with, of course, that purpose. No? What is it that we can do better? Um, on that note, uh, at some point in 2019, I was appointed deputy editor of the uh, uh, Italian magazine Domus, so for one year. Domus has been appointing different uh, directors in the last years, so as to complete a, a whole decade of with 10 different directors. So in order to understand or how to tackle a year of, at Domus, Domus is a very traditional architecture magazine. Probably you don't even know it. It's, I don't think it reaches in paper, it reaches uh, many places anymore because well, I mean, the industry is what it is. But anyway, it has 100 years of history of documenting architecture, especially. You know? But from, from a certain point of view, and, and what we did this time is, OK, let, in order to tackle the, the year at almost, let's look at this a series of urgencies. You may, you, you may agree or not, but for us, this was a way to get started. And how, how does that impact design? And how do we show this within an architecture magazine with the tradition of Domus? So anyway, editorially speaking, we started with this. This is the first image that we published because we understood, to me, this is design. This is the result of human presence on Earth. 
and this is a design. So that was, a, literally speaking, quite a, quite a problem, uh, problematic thing because Domus it's a, has a long tradition of monumentalized architecture, black and white, photo, black and white photography, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we started introducing this kind of imagery that is more from Time magazine. You know uh, what I mean? It's very journalistic, etc. But I found I found introducing this kind of uh, this kind of reportages and our articles way more interesting to start framing what design can do, no? Because also, at the end of the day, uh, mining is design. The crust is being transformed by the action of, of, uh, of, of humans, no? And what are the results of, climate, uh, of the climate breakdown? when it doesn't snow in the Alps in the summer, or when you start cutting off the rainforest in order to uh, plant uh, uh, oil, um, and what does that what does it do to the landscape no this is this is the this is indonesia and this is design somebody decided that line had to be cut off there no so we also invited artists in order to i mean there's the, there's the, this is the work of Olaf Eliasson who had brought a piece of the ice from the arctic to london so that the public could actually touch it for the first for the last time etc no so we gave domu sort of a a different a, a different look always accompanied with data because it's something that we, uh, as you know, or as I already mentioned, I work a lot with, with data. No? And also, what are the implications of certain political decisions in our daily lives and on design? No? So it was the year in which the United Kingdom was about to leave the European Union, a very painful, for some painful uh, moment in history, at least for me it was. And we decided to publish this picture, this picture which was actually the opposite, the ceremony of accession of the United Kingdom to the European Union. Um, and then position ourselves, position ourselves in, uh, in uh, what, are, what are going to be the consequences of one of the members of the EU leaving, uh, leaving something that had been very complicated and very, uh, let's say, painful to construct. And it's design. I, I, I do fully believe that it's design. Then we criticize gentrification, one of the topics you have been probably addressing often here. No? And what is the role of Europe? What is the role of European cities? I come from a country, Spain, where last year 84 million visitors came to visit. No, but there are not even 50 million people living there. You need to un understand what are the impacts of mass tourism in cities uh, that don't have the infrastructure to hold all these people with the selfie sticks, you know? And what are the consequences in housing, Airbnb? Do you regulate them? Do you not? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. The right to housing. How do you live in a city like Venice? How do you afford living in a city like Venice if 70% of the housing is actually occupied by Airbnb uh, uh, market? No. So is the role of the European Union to just become uh, the biggest amusement park of the planet while others produce, while others do war? I don't know. So uh, what is it? And this is something that kept us very busy for a, for a while. We published this manifesto, which is called Everything is Urbanism. Maybe I should have started with this in order to understand what is it that we were doing with Omus. For us, everything that you have seen is urbanism. And that's why we organize also yet another big model, in this case, and yet another big model with Lego. And this is a, this is some, this is a, a workshop that we did with the students, uh, about 12, 13 year old students that were looking at the future of the city of Milan. They produced these very nice and cool architectures. And we sent, they wrote a letter, a letter to the mayor of the Milan, which we published also in Domus. And uh, this is the students of Manara Secondary School. You see them there. They told the mayor what is it that they wanted for the city of Milan in the, in the future. No? Again, it's not only citizens or our future students or kids that also uh, address uh, other stakeholders. No? Well, this is just the covers of Domus. Domus became for a year more of a Time Newsweek magazine than a traditional architecture magazine. This is the only design cover that was, uh, <laughs> that was in the whole year. Um, and this is how we introduce fashion. This is Iris van Herpe. This is a designer from, uh, from the Netherlands with whom we have worked uh, also, uh, trying to understand uh, the role of fashion, fashion being one of the industries that pollute, pollutes the, more, uh, the most on our planet. And then and at the end of the year, we produce this compilation of everything that we have done. No? And then we produce this map. This is a very wide factory map, actually, in which everything 
all everything that we have talked about during that year was there. No? This is the, the world at the end of 2019, right before the pandemic started. And I wonder when seeing that if anything has actually changed much. Uh, but that's maybe uh, the topic for another conversation. So our concerns have gone more and more and more into the fabrication of this can be called the green metropolis or by, there are many ways of calling it. But all in all, what we are now interested in is in this, no? a design related exploration of states of symbiosis with the natural world and how do design that. No? And this is what we are busy with. Um, we have done this project with, uh, with other institutions trying to put together science, couture, which is a, a really interesting topic. Fashion design and urbanism, no, and trying to start looking at the from the micro scale to the uh, largest scale, or these networks, no, be it natural design or man-made design, etc., moving up to the human body, and how do you cover your body? This is the work that we did with Iris van Herpe, and uh, how do you work with it? Then not only the what covers the body, what surrounds you, which is the built environment, the house, the networks of the city, and then moving into the entire planet. No? So this is, was a little bit of the, the scope of this ambitious green project uh, uh, work. No? And we looked at, uh, together with On Top is Us, On Top is lo Us looking at the challenges of the future that I was looking at there earlier or mentioning earlier. And then come the work of Iris van Herpe no? and the work that she's been doing because she's extremely interested in new materials and science and nature, etc. And then how can we link that work with our work and produce visions of the city together, no? which are visions like this video that you're going to see now. This is a video that puts together our work with the work of Iris van Herpe. No? Uh, in this case, we were, well, in this exhibition or this research, was going to produce about 10 visualizations of the future, putting together our interests and hers. And in this case, what we're looking at was fungi, mycelium. No, she has been working with a, a lot with mycelium as a material for, for her work, for her art. Um, and we have been looking, of course, at mycelium in architecture. So we took, we took one of the buildings that Vinnie Mas and VRDB did and actually made it even better, I would say. We covered it with uh, spores and mycelium and then have these two, uh, let's say, worlds work together. It's a two minute video, so. This is a dress made with uh, fungi that releases spores. The model is Russian, she can no longer work in the European Union. If she would work in the European Union, maybe her family will be uh, deeply impacted by the Russian regime. So it's uh, all is connected. So basically, we took the, the drawings from MBRDV and reinterpret this building, which is an apartment uh, block in the, in the south of Amsterdam, a very recent project. I'm going to show you something a little bit more fun, which is uh, over here. So putting her in relationship, what we were building. You see now that the building is doing the same that her dress was doing in the beginning. So it was her idea for the dress. She doesn't call it dress, but I don't find a better word. Uh, she calls it a piece, no? or look, actually. And then I think this is a better version of the existing MBRDV building. Disseminating all these sports uh, into the city of Amsterdam. We do a lot of video work. This is the work that we do at the White Factory as well. And we always produce videos uh, for almost every, uh, every research that you have seen uh, by the Y Factory. Then, uh, then this was going to become an exhibition in, inside the building and the exhibition design. Again, I try to bring all this research. How do I engage with the public? No? How do I make the public actually walk 
this a little bit of an oppressive space showing the shit in which we are, all right? And then once you are oh, a little bit anxious and then say, oh my goodness, what do we do? Uh, what is going on, etc., etc.?" Then you finally circulate inside a much larger space. We will get there in a moment, here. And then this is an open space in which you have Edith van Herpen's looks together with our visions for the future city. And each of the looks has this kind of relationship which you just saw in the video. No? So somehow you there marvel, no? and the public is hopefully wondering, wow, other worlds are possible. No? What, do, what can science and nature and, uh, and research do? And then not to end there, then you go up in another area in which there's a space for these discussions. One of the things that you don't want to do when you start explaining how terrible this section is, is to make the public impotent. No? What is it I can do in front of this? Nothing, then I prefer to go. So the point of these spaces up there is to actually decide, okay, to what extent you as a citizen can collaborate into mitigating the, uh, the, the, the disaster. No? Anyway, this is the last of the projects I'm showing. This is the Green Deep, and I will be very quick. This is going to print tomorrow, so it will be out in a month. This is the last book of the, of the White Factory. Green, yes, green, as simple as that. And then what we do is to uh, elaborate or work on a software that allows to uh, introduce different uh, plants according to the different biomes in the city. We look at their performances, et cetera, et cetera, what each plant needs and does. And uh, then how do you can implement it in different architectural components, architectural typologies, and then start to see what the performance of this green environment is in one square kilometer of different cities on the planet, which have, of course, different biomes, vegetation, uh, biodiversity, etc. This is a far-fetched image of Fifth Avenue in New York City. I don't know if it's uh, too far-fetched, if it looks like a ruin or not, but at least our images tend to provoke. Many times, some people say, yeah, but this looks like you're you know, your spaces in Madrid where the ruins have taken over, uh, nature has taken over the ruin, no? But I think we'll, we try to move that, uh, be, uh, beyond that and aspire to inspire uh, certain publics, no? Which is what we did in the last exhibition in, in, in Hangzhou, China, in September, starting finally, this is the famous section, being built there with a Chinese translation, Chinese censorship. So a great deal of the tags that you saw on the digital file were pulled out by the Chinese censors and uh, taken away, so because some subjects are uncomfortable. Um, how the software works, and then in the end we made this uh, 360 video immersion showing what the cities of the future would like if you start planting them in the way that you are, that you are, seeing, that you are seeing them. No? And this is where, of course, the public starts to wonder no? and lives with a better feeling, oh, wow, this can happen. No? And this is a little bit the message you end up communicating. You need to deal with different publics. No? And this is how some of them hopefully leave thinking that it's possible to do uh, other things. I think we can move into the next uh, final. I'm going to finish with this. No? This is a little bit what we try to do. Put uh, those who take decisions in front of this world. No? And then, I mean, she is gone. Angela Merkel, he is around. Um, so what is it? that the world will look like if we do nothing? And what is it that the world could look like if we start doing this and that? No, there's some, we want to talk to um, those publics that uh, need to recycle, recycle and those others who take those decisions in places like Davos. And you may say, well, these are already gone. But the thing is that even though he doesn't win the election and I don't know what's going to happen, but others will come. No? And this is, this, is a, this is a very local note, but I think that you will understand. Uh, others will come indeed. This is the result of the election in the country where I reside right now in the Netherlands. And you see the, the, the surprise face of this lady there. This lady in green didn't, couldn't believe that she won the election to the Senate, to the Dutch Senate. She just couldn't believe it. And this is, and then I said, well, she doesn't even believe it. Let's see what they are about. So, and then I started just reading what is it that they do. I will just zoom in, you know, and this is what they are. Anti-EU, anti-immigration, and in favor of banning burqas for Muslims. Also, really bad or even worse. 
What is it do they think, that they think about climate change? The reason why we are redesigning or trying to design things is this is that this climate change thing fits neatly into a populist frame that portrays climate action as a new form of tyranny by governments and global elites over ordinary, hardworking citizens whose legitimate concerns are largely being ignored. So they are just denying climate change, denying the breakdown. So if those politicians are elected, good luck, okay? And they are being elected. They are being elected all over the planet. And this is, I'm going to finish with this note, don't worry. This is a map of my country, the Netherlands. This is the last election in the fall, the results of the election. Gray, as you can imagine, is the extreme right, the populist, those that think that climate action is just a form of tyranny, tyranny. I guess these are concepts familiar to you as well here in the United States. And what you see in blue is the traditional conservative Tory party. And what you see in red is the traditional, in British terms, Labour party. And then I immediately did the following experiment. I put the names and the locations of the top 10 universities of the Netherlands. Do you see something there? Is there a certain correlation? You don't need to be a scientific, super scientific of a Nobel Prize to understand what I mean. Is what I'm saying is that we, universe, look at Delft, is that a small, super red dot there, surrounded by gray and by blue, which is money. So we are becoming maybe sort of fortresses of knowledge of agreement, et cetera, et cetera. And we are definitely not capable of transferring that knowledge to other places. I have the impression that we have become this kind of village fortified against those crazy Romans around us. No? Have you seen, uh, do you know Asterix or Obelix? Maybe this is European <laughs> traditions, etc. cetera. No? But there was this village of people, uh, of native uh, French people in, the, in, in Gallia, in France, surrounded by the Roman Empire, because luckily they found this amazing, uh, amazing poison so that they could resist. Anyway, if we don't transfer knowledge, I have the impression that we will be soon uh, led by people with bad hair. So on that note, I would like you to invite to transfer knowledge against bad hair, if I can say that. Um, so because what happens in the end is that when bad hair starts taking over, I receive emails like this one. I, received, I couldn't believe when I received it. I didn't do anything about it. I won't say who wrote it, but I received this image, this, this email. And then you start to get, on one hand, flattered, no? Because you say, oh, this has an impact. Another other hand has an impact, you know? Otherwise, they wouldn't care. But at the same time, you start getting very scared because this is sent by somebody with very bad hair. Then uh, it is maybe problematic. So anyway, this is what it makes me feel at the end of the day, a little bit like her, you know, somebody on, a, on this kind of tightrope. I took this image in, in, in Zimbabwe this summer. No, this is the Victoria Falls. It's a beautiful landscape. And there's this woman trying to cross uh, from one side to the other. And I actually felt a little bit like her. Sometimes like, oh, yo, 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 yo. Another time, you, 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 you are wrong. And other times you, you, you fall, but you don't fall out completely, etc., etc. But I like this. Because in the end, you know, she's reaching the end and she does actually finish and make it. So this is a little bit of a, a trying to uplifting end. I thank you very much. But, uh, and I hope that you have questions. Yes, there, yeah, no. You're off. This is off. I don't I don't think you got, oh yeah, there. Somewhere like that. Yeah. So uh yeah, we're gonna do as we usually do. So if there are questions, I will take the mic to to the person that is raising uh, their hands. Uh we typically like that the students start asking the questions and, and maybe some faculty afterwards. <coughs> Hello. I'm not a student, but i um, very interested in the work that you're doing. Um, so when it comes to the fact that you guys are located in Europe, how does that correspond to coming over here? And like, how do Americans, 
is there any way that like your work can be done over here as well, like opening a new branch or something like that, where um, Americans who are interested, not necessarily able to travel so much, but like want to make changes here in our country. Um, how is the Y Factory able to, I guess, uh, collaborate here? Yeah. Um, so thanks for your question and your interest in the Y Factory. The Y Factory has already worked in the US. So we did a semester at Columbia in New York. And I think that the concerns and the topics that we are talking about and addressing are common. Uh, what we do in, 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 in the other side of the pond could be done in, uh, in the United States and, of course, elsewhere, other places. We have done research in, in, in Hong Kong or research in China, in Australia. So it's, I think that many of the topics are absolutely common, as I said. And uh, there are some difference, of course, from country to country, from culture to culture, not only from country to country, from region to region, inside countries, etc. I live in Philadelphia now and doesn't have so much to do with urbanization in this area of, of the country. So I think this diversity is something that the Y Factory has been tackling for, for many years. And, and we are happy to, uh, to exchange. It's not uh, also our students come from, uh, from everywhere. So it's not really a Dutch or European uh, entity as, as, as such. As a, uh, yeah, as a continuation, as a corollary answer, response, actually, the only thing he was interested about when we were arranging this lecture was, please, David, find me someone to talk about Atlanta, Charlotte, and yes. <laughs> and I was like, oh. So he is really interested. And he actually was uh, yesterday having a two hour interview with John Gaber and just to understand what's going on here. And you're actually going to publish a piece at Domus about that, right? So the, I think this is this kind of curiosity at looking at the built environment and then disseminating the findings is something that it's embedded in his being. So I don't think he can just. <laughs> and in the. <laughs> you should take him to the Grange. To the Grange? What is the Grange? It's that subdivision on the outskirts of Clemson. Oh, right. It's going to be the new landscape of Sherlanda. Oh, my gosh. What is the name? The Grange. Subdivision. Oh, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. It's a bad development. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a good name. Sure. Yeah, it's one of another dystopian of those. You can take beautiful pictures there, too. <laughs> there you are. So I was real interested in your studies of the of the kind of development projects in Spain and, and, and elsewhere. And it'd be interesting to kind of reflect back and look at cities like Brasilia. Like Brasilia, you know, in terms of what they've become, how they were envisioned, and how they've evolved over time. So I'd be curious to know whether those landscapes that you showed in Africa and there, what may happen to them in 20 years, or 40 years, or 50 years, or 100 years. You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? It'd be really curious to understand, because I think that pattern didn't start in the, in, the 20, in the 21st century. It started in the middle of the 20th century. It started in the early part of the 20th What I have the impression of Yes, uh, I think the scope is completely different, and maybe Brasilia was one in how many years. But the thing is that when you see at the low exponential speed and scale of these projects, this is what you start to worry, you know? And Brasilia is one moment by, let's say, 
one government, one only in the country. We are talking about that over 50% of the urban area around Madrid is like this right now. And we move to the next phase, which is places like the African continent. I, don't th I think that we have celebrated those experiments very well. Um, I don't know, there are so many uh, from other periods. For me, what is worrying is that uh, these places will most likely not be occupied the way we think or we expect or they expect that they are going to be occupied. And the amount of thousands and thousands of acres of landscape uh, depleted will stay there forever. So let's say from the from that point of view, I'm not going to enter into modern discussions about modernism, etc. Just about territory. How much territory is being consumed, destroyed, and left over? No? Uh, there's no planet B. So if we keep doing this at that scale, uh, well, you know what's gonna what's gonna happen. So what I think is, I wouldn't really compare that to new towns from the modern area. I think we are in the next, I would say, uh, stage, uh, even though indeed somebody goes into the, uh, into the plains of Brazil, decides to draw the famous airplane uh, plan, and et cetera, et cetera, no? But that happens once. But now when you start counting how many hectares or thousands of acres are being transformed as we speak, it's completely different. I think that I think that also the modern project didn't have so much to do. There was a more of a, you know, criticizer or not. There's a certain patronizing, and I'm gonna give you. So, there's no even that, even though that failed, there was a sense of common good in many of those projects in the past. There's no common good uh, being looked for here. No, it's all about it's all about other yeah other interests. So I think that. Instead, in order to differentiate, you know, the question, yeah, but Brasilia was the same kind of thing. Well, fail or not, there was this aspiration for the common good, which is not at all present in any of the projects that you saw, nor in Spain or in Africa or anything like that. And that's a big difference at the cost of an entire country's territories, biomes, etc. As a new architecture student, one of the things that I've noticed is we do a lot of one-off projects and looking at big global issues. And especially for me, one of the things I'm always concerned about is plastics and climate change. So how do you balance these single exhibitions that are very transient and consume resources versus focusing on these bigger ideas that we're trying to change and save the planet? I mean, it's something that I'll try and look at and justify every day in my learning. How do you do it professionally? Didn't understand it. Right. Okay, so I think that we need to be aware and of what is around us. Extremely aware. We are just not. I think every line you draw has a consequence. You draw. I, let me. I, those at home must be suffering. That's why. Um, Every time, I think it's important that we designers know that we just don't draw because it's cool to draw, no? That our uh, industry is one of the most polluting on the planet. That your design decisions, that the materials that you use to use have an impact more than ever on a uh, climate crisis that uh, is way faster than we expected. And I think that this is what we try to do by listing all these urgencies, no? That do not, do not cover only climate breakdown. They cover other all social issues, no? The city is the place where collectives meet. The world uh, politics, I don't know if you know, the world politics comes from the Greek polis. Polis in Greek means city. So the fabrication of the city is a pure political act, especially speaking about Brasilia, no, but many others. So every decision you make about making a, you just mentioned an urban plan outside Clemson, that's a political act. That's a way of life that we push that has uh, extreme political consequences. consequences. Urbanization patterns have political implications. What I'm trying to tell you is that everything that you are doing when you are doing your drawings have 
planetary impact. It, it, it's, not about, it's not only the butterfly effect, it's really like that. No? Also, when you look at, for instance, the maps of the Brexit uh, uh, referendum, where was Brexit most supported? In suburbia. And I'm not going to talk about the Trump election either, because I want, I, OK, I, I prefer to say a little bit out of that, uh, because it's your country who, that you know better. No? But you, when you analyze those patterns, you realize that urbanization, which is your design decision, have a lot of impact in societies, cultures, politics, et cetera. No? When it comes to social justice, uh, it's migration, r racism, et cetera. It's something that you need to take into account. This is what we tried. We have spent so many years making that big list, which ended up becoming that uh, section of the crust. I don't know if I'm responding to your question, no? but uh, you just cannot sit in your room with or in front of your computers with Rhino. Oh, this is great. Oh, this is cool. This is amazing. It is. It is, you know. <laughs> it's not just a sculpture that you will have made in clay at home. You're going to take over a certain amount of territory. There will be political decisions behind the implementation of that object. And that's something that you should never forget, especially when you see those landscapes of ruined cities, incomplete development, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Designers and architects and urban designers, when interviewing them, they said, I don't have anything to do with that. This was the politician. The politician decided to do this. And then we just came there and designed, hello, come on. Are you that dumb? Didn't you know that this was going to fail? Didn't you know that this was, this, is, this was just something that didn't have anything to do, that somebody else, you know, you are just like there, a very naive figure, you know, trying to do your best? I don't buy that. So we actually claim that designers, us, are complicit with those, uh, with those products. So what I try, and then you go back to your home, and then you will start building. But at least once, there was this guy who told you that you are responsible of what you're doing. And then just do things in China. Uh, no? OK. But at least one day, somebody told you that. <laughs> I think this is really working better. So let's, let's just use the microphone. All right. Let's see. OK. Um, so my question is, I, I think I have two questions, but I'm not sure if I can frame it right. But uh, I think one thing that's interesting about like the work you produce is like, that idea of a precedent and, and how uh, you use sort of a precedent that's like a, a part of who you are, like uh, your experience in life. Um, and one thing that I urge my students to do is just bring their personal precedents to the conversation so that they could have a backing to like really think about the problems, the issues. Um, so I'm wondering, like, now that you, your life is just a series of like evolutions that built from that foundation, and I'm wondering how optimistic you are about like some of the work you're doing now, and then how you see like that evolution sort of uh, came about. And then my second question is, I guess, in relation to precedent and the importance of drawing. Um, I know you said you're not a historian, but you you are a drawer and how the importance of drawing can have on like history and like mapping history on top of history problems on top of problems and how as architects we could uh, contribute to yeah the global economy thank you for the double question um if i am optimistic i try to be we need to be, and then if I say the opposite, I cannot say that in a, in a university. You are all young students wanting to do great things in the future. So, but we are pretty doomed. <laughs> Otherwise, I would be too naive to say. That said, I think that that's why we have to mobilize in order to stop this uh, tsunami which is coming. And I, for me, that's why the third word in my presentation is called act, do something you know, start doing. Uh, so research, we have knowledge, we try to disseminate it and communicate it with the purpose of inviting others to act. You don't need to be the mega, act I mean, not every one of us is Martin Luther King. No, of course not. It's very difficult. But I think that little, a little, we can all, 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 all do. So I am very pessimistic, yes. Being optimistic, I have to be at the university. I'm trying to be very, very frank, and I mean, you are all adults, so, uh, why? This is not Walt Disney, 
Okay. And second, going to your um, to second question, drawing, of course, allows to reveal uh, facts, happenings, events uh, that are not that easy to read in historical production. Um, but as I mentioned with the Paris Habitat, which was a really, it was, we were digging into history. For us, it was very, very important to redraw in order to compare and try to eliminate this kind of, uh, uh, when you curate, an exhibition like the one of Paris Habitat, you need to take a stance. You need to look at, the, at things from a certain, a certain uh, perspective. You cannot talk about everything. It was a short-term project. So if we could have spoken about the histories behind the people that were moved to those places, who wanted or who didn't want. That was also extremely interesting, no? How the places are inhabited, we did a little bit. But in the end, we decided what was the contribution of that housing to the fabrication of a certain agenda, those density, intensity, fertility, agility, etc. No? So uh, we redrew to do that. And that's something that we did on purpose. And for that drawing, it's extremely, extremely important to interpret the past. And for me, that's the past of the present. Just make it yours. That also, it's another kind of methodology. You know? Make it yours by redrawing it. I think you learn a lot when you are uh, trying to understand what the architect or the designer was doing when uh, thinking of those houses. No? And then get a good grip of the measurements, et cetera. And that's something which is a simple methodology that is very helpful. As you see, everything I've done is redrawn. I'm, ask, I'm answering your question so-so, but uh, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Feel like TV show? No. Uh, no. Um, howdy. Um, so there's obviously <laughs> a lot of polarization in America, but one like kind of recent consensus that's forming is this move towards like anti-globalism and trade protectionism and also just controlling supply chains with it within the U.S. Um, this is kind of dovetailing into um, the U.S.'s like environmental um, initiatives. If you look at the Inflation Reduction Act that passed a couple years ago, there's a lot of, and the CHIPS Act as well. And a lot of this, I think, is targeted at seeing like growth and development in places like China, Southeast Asia, and now Africa, and seeing that the US has really missed out on a lot of this, um, and we're kind of entering a new age of industrialization. Um, I've heard a lot of criticism from particularly the EU that these policies are kind of unfair and don't allow for like collaboration um, across continents and um, allowing these like industries to mature at the rate necessary to really address these problems. So I kind of wonder, um, you clearly have had a lot of experience through these journalistic endeavors all around the country, and it seems like you think of the world as much more connected in these pursuits. Um, however, there is kind of this growing push to kind of solve um, at least the problems affecting America within America. Um, and that's not necessarily new, um, but it is kind of shifting this economic paradigm that has existed for um, the last several decades. Um, so yeah, I guess I just wonder how you interpret this, uh, this tension and maybe what effects it will have on uh, these larger scale developments and um, yeah, just the, the things you're interested in. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thanks for your question. So I think that's a very complex one, and we could have a, yet a couple of yet a couple of hours there about it. What I would say is that uh, you mentioned uh, extra protectionism in the United States, no? United States of America, for starters, America goes from Alaska to Patagonia. So um, United States of America. So in the United States of America, there's a certain protectionist move, just like there is in the European Union. So that, that, that doesn't make any difference. Uh, I think we need to uh, thread very lightly there. No? I think there's uh, consequences of globalization that have proven to be negative. But I think what you are th uh, looking at, uh, for instance, the pandemic. The pandemic arrives. And at least, where I was in the European Union. I was in the Netherlands, of course. And when masks are necessary, there are no factories in Europe to cover for the mask demand. 
The masks are produced by the Chinese industry. The Chinese start bargaining and making the prices rise skyrocket because, of course, that becomes sort of a Berber market. And then that was the one who pays the most, the one is the one that takes, gets the mask. That was a horrible thing to, to experience, no? How some people were making lots of sheet of money, which is not even, I think it's, it's very moral from my point of view. They were making all that money uh, in order to sell masks to the European Union. And I don't know about the case in the US, so that's of America. That's why I'm not mentioning that. So that is a consequence of globalization when we thought that all the masks could be produced in China and all these could be produced there and all that produced or the chips in Taiwan, etc. No, That's something to be criticized about globalization. And there's many voices saying we need to produce certain things locally. No, And within the European Union, there's voices saying we need to bring back industry. We cannot depend because of geopolitics on that globalization that made China the factory of the world, and the day something goes wrong, there will be no masks. No, that's, that's something I could agree on, on let's say there's limits to globalization. But what we are mentioning there, I think is an extreme protectionism that has, that has links with nationalism, and that then make the others different to you. And this is where I don't agree. You know, this is I can understand that we want to produce masks in the center of uh, France. Yes, fine. What I don't agree is that I am French and you are not. And this is where we need to really thread very light. And that's what you are mentioning. I have the, I have the impression that when somebody wants to make America great again, or the United States of America great again by imposing this kind of protectionist regulation, I don't think there's a, too much of an anti-globalization discourse. I think that this is a supremacist discourse to say, you are not like me. And this causes a lot of problems. So I think we, uh, I oppose that way of thinking because I think the, way, the, the thinking behind there is to say, I am superior to you, which is not the same thing as, a, as saying, let's bring the mask production back to a local context so that when something problematic happens, uh, we, can, uh, we can react. I think there's a difference uh, there. I don't know if I'm exactly answering your question, but uh, we are talking about a certain, I am what you are not. And those are borders that I don't uh, like, uh, uh, how to say, uh, putting on. Hey, thank you for the lecture. Uh, I loved your process of redrawing things as a form of analysis. And uh, one of the things that shocked me the most was whenever you had your exhibition in Africa about all the new developments that are going around, is that it sounded like there wasn't much of a reaction there, or at least whenever you compared that to moving that uh, exhibition in Germany, that there is much more of a, uh, a dialogue to be had. And so what I'm wondering is like, uh, one, what was the conversation like with the community whenever it was in Africa and the people who had it, what was that? Uh, was it perceived and how did they respond? And also like, I'm wondering if there was like any sort of like maybe different way of communicating it that might have uh, that might have communicated the uh, the the issue more, or if there is any way that if you were to go back there again today, how might you go about addressing that in that context? Thanks. Uh, the ex the first exhibition was not in Africa; it was in Kuala Lumpur. That's in Malaysia. So uh, wasn't really uh, wasn't really talking to the. But it's it's the the question is still completely valid. Uh, and the next, the next time we organized that exhibition was in uh, Munich, Germany. Indeed, outside of the context. I am, I am uh, let's say, self-criticizing what we did. We were two white men, okay, coming from outside Africa, looking at Africa, which is what Kul has used to do with Lagos, but nowadays is probably not that well perceived. I think that one of the things that is important to do now, what I would do next, then the pandemic came, so... Yeah, you know what happened. So, but uh, what I think would be really interesting to do now is to start establishing local partnerships 
with places, with the places we are looking at. No? If we could go to Accra in Ghana with a uh, local a stakeholder and start exchanging on what is it that we know about urbanization and what they know about the way their context is urbanizing, that would be, I think, the next step to take. No? Also, it is important that we change our mindset probably. Yeah, what we started doing nowadays, it's really not enough. And I agree with that. No? And the, the next thing would be to organize the exhibition together with the stakes, local stakeholders in those places and see, uh, and see how uh, things could go further in this research. Stop the process. I doubt it, but maybe you can curb it. That's what I would hope for. Uh, I think stopping is just a, or curb it, yeah. But finishing, implicating uh, local stakeholders, I think that this is what's missing in this research. Hi. Um, so I hear all the talk about urbanization. Generally, that's in the city, like the metropolitan concrete, but does that relate to as well like farmland? Because one of my focuses is farmland um, in a matter of trying to kind of like take back our nutrition in a way, like and then having people and taking back from all the commercialism that's happening with developers constantly building apartments, buying up so many parts of land and just making it into apartments. Um, and rental communities really and not allowing people to have land of their own. Um, that's one of the things that I see consistently happening here, even where we live in Charlotte. It's like everywhere you turn, there's a new apartment complex coming up. Now there's neighborhoods of apartments. So um, does that does the work that you guys do, urbanization at um, the Y Factory, does it have any does it help at all with the farming? Does it do any focusing on farming? Thanks. Uh, the word uh, urbanization to me, to me refers to human settlement. So farming is human settlement. And farming is urbanization, no matter how intense, how dense uh, it is. So I think that all kind of rural communities, etc., are uh, urbanized land to a certain extent. Of course, if you compare it to a, uh, a block of apartments in the middle of uh, Charlotte, it's a different uh, urban result. But urban nevertheless. Um, that's one thing. Then uh, to your question about the housing blocks, I'm totally in favor of collective housing, as I mentioned at the beginning of the, of the talk. Why? Because density allows us not to occupy, keep occupying so much territory. Then what you need to see is in this context, this is some uh, an act of speculation. Somebody's just becoming rich with this housing and there's no construction of any justice by the, the change of the neighborhood, that's something that needs to be the study. But per se, the urban form is not guilty of that. So an apartment complex in a uh, established urban center like Charlotte's, I would say welcome, but then, then come what is behind. And is this happening on what kind of grounds? Was this belonging to somebody else? Who was evicted? Who was not? What policies have been implemented? That's, that's a completely different thing, layer, that needs to be added to uh, the, a certain housing topology, which per se, uh, I don't know how to say, which per se is innocent, if I, if, I may, if I may say, by the way you implement it or you build it, that's, that's the discussion. But I don't have that, I don't have that information, so. what is happening in cities like Charlotte and not necessarily in the city of because that is you know it is what it is it's it's a built up city just out and around it um a lot of the building of new apartments are pricing people out. There aren't affordable apartments being built um, and where people could have the opportunity to buy a house because it's cheaper to own than rent in, in some in areas like that. Um, it's pricing everyone out and it's not giving people the option to have their own home. And apartment living, been doing it for five years, it's not that fun as you get older. <laughs> 
Of course, I understood where you were headed, but <laughs> it's good that you say it because I don't know the, that precise context. But what you're talking about, Charlotte, is happening all over the world and it's happening in Europe as well. No, So you build apartments in the center of consolidated urban areas that make the areas even more expensive. And there are people who cannot afford living there and they need to move out to the outskirts. It happens in so many places of the world. So the apartment is not the problem. The way you manage the apartment is a problem. That's the difference. So in this case, I would, I'm not opposed to uh, apartment complex. I'm opposed who's behind the fabrication of that apartment complex. And as I, say, I said, the French constitution says that 30% of, of, of new housing must be affordable. You know, And you just apply the law. You just regulate. And then those that are building those apartment complexes, we have to respect the law. And the law says that 30% must be affordable, deal with it. But that's regulation. Sorry, I, I know it's a word which sounds a little bit strange in this context, but let's regulate. You know, If you leave capitalism to their own devices, the poor will just have to leave, I don't know how many miles away. But for that, this is what states do, is protect their citizens who vote. So I vote to be protected also by my estate. I vote not to be left in, by, my, in my, own, by my own devices. So lately, the province of South Holland in the Netherlands, which is not socialist at all, okay? The Netherlands is a non-socialist uh, context at all. This province approved or passed the law saying that 60% of the new housing built by real estate developers must have a certain degree of protection and that 30% of that amount must be social, social rental. Then developers, if they want to keep making money, which they will do, will have to uh, apply the law, follow the law, respect the law. So I think that's, and the apartment is not guilty of anything. <laughs> the architecture is not guilty of anything there. Then we can discuss if the housing is, is good, if the floor plan is actually working, if the common spaces are necessary or not. Public space can be designed in a certain manner. That's, yeah, we can enter into design questions. But what you are talking about is uh, another, uh, let's say, another question independent from architecture or urbanism itself. I, you know what I mean? So thanks a lot, Javier. That was a fascinating lecture. We're going to be keep talking about it during dinner. And, uh, and thanks a lot, everyone, for those questions. That was a really, that was a really, yes, good discussion. Thank you. Thank you.